The blood on my face and shirt was my father's. I had drawn that blood from him in the evil kitchen of our house. That same cold kitchen where his young children had been so cruelly beaten and robbed of their childhood. The blood droplets were trickling towards my mouth and I tried to stop them, willing my tongue to remove this sticky sensation that filled me with a sense of sickness. I couldn't because my tongue was fixed to the base of my mouth. I was tongue-tied. It was a defect from birth and one that caused me to be the subject of ridicule, especially as I suffer from dyslexia, a cross-wiring in my brain. I was slowly sinking deeper and deeper into myself. We're in Bath in the west of England, the home of Robert Hicks, who has produced and printed over a hundred million pieces of gospel literature, including a special edition of the King James Bible, which he gifted to the Queen on her Golden Jubilee. Growing up, he suffered abuse, neglect, being tongue-tied and unable to read and write. His life changed when he found a Bible in the darkest of places. We traveled up to Birmingham with Robert to talk about his early years of growing up in the slums during the Second World War. I cannot remember any good thing of that slum area late at night. You heard the husbands who had gone out for a drink being back drunk. And many of them would be sick before they got into the house. And I can still, in my mind, see these ladies now, that the, the matron of the slum area, which in my day was my grandma, she would be going on knocking on the doors, telling the ladies to come out and clear up the mess of their husbands. So I do remember the smell of a lot of beer and cheap bacon and greasy bacon and that kind of stuff. You were born during wartime while bomb raids were happening. Do you have any memories about that? Well. As you can see, Birmingham's a very large place and it's a very different place. Like most cities, it was bombed extensively. The people that suffered the most were people in the slums because their buildings were soon knocked over. The families were scattered the moment it happened. Some had to go and live with parents here or uncle and auntie there. It was a disruption of life. The bombs just kept coming. The houses just kept falling. The families kept moving. The children were being taken into care and out of care. And we were no different from that. We ourselves would be moved from different houses and different institutions. The other problems we had, of course, was not only mother having lots of babies, um, but she herself admits that people said she kept a brothel and she herself admits that she had lots of parties going on there and lots of things were happening. So life at home was odd, even when I don't remember it, it was odd. I, uh, maybe that's why I don't remember ever knowing my mother till the age of six. Maybe she was there, but we never knew she was there because other things was taking place. But it was not a nice place to be living in. The homes were better than uh, what was taking place at home. In 1946, Robert was in a care home when his mother collected him just before Christmas. He remembered it had been bitterly cold. In fact, it was one of the coldest winters on record. She brought him to 335 Stonehouse Lane, Bartley Green, their new home. This would be the beginning of a nightmare that would last for years to come. What were your first memories? My, my memory was coming into a a house and snow all around. So everything was pure. So just opposite to the slums, it looked clean, it clean but, it, but it felt cold. There was five of us in one bed, just where that 
glass there is now, that window is now. Five of us in one bed, and that's quite a small room. It may look on the outside large, but actually it was quite a small room. How long was it until your father came back? Not long afterwards. And when he came home, I thought he was a hero from the war, you see. Oh. Within 48 hours, that picture that I had of a man being a hero in the Second World War disappeared. Immediately there was arguments and fights and it was a very violent house. Both mom and dad were violent to each other and you kept out of people's ways. What about uh, things, basic needs like food and clothes? Um, we didn't have proper food, no proper clothes. We had to be clothed by charities. But I can't remember sandwiches, I can't remember, you know, anything put on them. Um, if it wasn't for three school meals a school, then I think we'd have very likely died of food. You know, we just didn't have food. When Mother left five years later, then the abuse really started. So there was a time when I was on my own with Dad, and I used to curl up in the corner of the kitchen when I knew he was going to be violent, and um, hoped that I could protect myself as much as I can. It was a dark, dark place. It was a difficult place. It was a place where none of the children's natural creative energies that children have could flourish. There was no child in that house that really could say they had a childhood. So Robert, now after all this time coming back, what are you left with? I think that's actually more difficult to express. I am angry that we live in a world where children still suffer. And this brings back suffering behind doors. Of course we're pleased that most people are not like that, but it still happens. And it still happens on the same scale after the post-war years. There were many people here in this row who loved their children, who cared for their children. Um, I used to envy some at the further down that you could see that the parents really cared for the children and loved their children and protected their children and they lived a different life. One place Robert could find some freedom was the countryside, which was on his doorstep. He would run off into the fields and play for hours, staying away from home for as long as possible. We visited his favorite childhood spot. This is where you would come to uh, escape. This was definitely the place I came to escape once I discovered it. Looking back, I realized it was a mental, emotional, and a spiritual experience in the sense that it brought God nearer to me. In the evening, we didn't have any artificial light, so when the stars came out, the stars of heaven and the stars on the water blended into one magical um, feeling. And years later, I began to realize that maybe heaven is a lot nearer than we think. So your mother left quite suddenly, and after she left, how did things start to change in the home? Well, everything changed. Um, first thing, we were put into institutions, why things were sorted out with local authorities. And after a time, we came back to live with Dad, which was a big mistake. I can remember when Dad had uh, hit Brian many times in his leg, and I thought the leg was going to come off, it was so bad. When Brian went to school the next day, he... Um, he said he'd fallen off a bike and he hadn't got a bike and he didn't know how to ride a bike, but in those days people turned a blind eye to things, today they wouldn't. Donald was the first one, the oldest, he'd been taken away, then Jean was taken away, then Bernard and Brian was taken away. Jack himself had been sent to Switzerland for convalescent because they had a, a very heavy asthma attacks, big attacks. And suddenly I was on my own with Dadu. I became the object of um, a lot of his cruelty. Um, I used to do the washing and the cooking and the cleaning and all those kind of things. And I used to try and do it in such a way that he'd have nothing to criticize, but he always found something to criticize. Uh, no, it was, it was a total disintegration of the family. Mother left when I was 11 and she didn't make contact with anybody. She absolutely knew that if the children was left with Dad on his own, it was going to be hell on earth, and it was.
When your sister came home, your father's abuse escalated. It did. Jean got the worst. Um, I don't know whether she was 13 or 14 when she started being raped, but when she was being raped, he wasn't bullying the boys, or in this case, me. Um, and I didn't know what was happening, and she didn't confide in me at all. But she tried to commit suicide, and I couldn't quite understand it. I knew the home life was bad, but I didn't realise she was going through a second hell, whereas we was going through a first hell, she was going through a second hell. I do remember that she came and said, let's kill Dad. And I said, well, how are we going to do that? So we thought of various ways, but the only one that seemed to appeal, that we would gas him, that we would um, make sure that the gas in his room was on when he was asleep and we put some blankets or coats to stop the thing. It wouldn't have worked because the windows would have needed to be sealed because they were so bad, um, but we didn't do that. With having two major setbacks of being tongue-tied and dyslexic, what were some of the frustrations you had in school, at home, making friends? As far as the school was concerned, I just began to believe that what everybody else said, that I was an idiot. The, the psychology of being called an idiot so many times, I think I actually began to believe that maybe I was um, damaged mentally in some kind of way. I didn't know that I was dyslexic. Um, I didn't even know I was tongue-tied. I just felt that I had a problem speaking. There's something wrong with me. Didn't make friends. How do you make friends if you can't communicate? When it came to English lessons, I couldn't do them. I could do maths easy and no problem with analytical work. But when it came to um, anything to do with English, not, not at all. So it was bad news. When I left school, the headmaster had given me the certificate so I could leave school, but he also said, what a waste, to me very quietly, but he said, what a waste. And I had felt I was a waste. I felt I was nothing, I was a nobody. I felt there was nothing there at all. And the obstacle for my future was my father, and I decided that I would fight him come what may. Normally I would go into a corner and curl up, and when Dad began to flex his muscles tight, then you knew something was coming and his muscles was beginning to flex. And I decided I was going to, to do it. So I hit him with all the force that I could. And his head did come down and my knee did go up and I did loosen two teeth and get rid of one of them. And then while he was on the floor, I ran into the small pantry, put a... Um, a broomstick up against it so he couldn't get in. So I stayed there most of the night then. And he eventually went off to bed and he never kicked me again. And when I first started work, this lady, Mrs. Siddle, worked in the same shop that I was the errand boy and she was a nurse. She'd gone through a divorce and so she had to pack in nursing to look after her two teenage children. So she worked daytime in the mm. shop. And she used to give me spelling lessons, frustrating spelling lessons for her and for myself. And then she said, can I have a look? And she said, you're tongue-tied. I said, go to the doctors tonight. I was in an hospital within two weeks. Can you imagine it? Two weeks. And the surgeon had all these students around him because they wanted to show the students what happens if you're really tongue-tied, if it's left. Most children, if they're tongue-tied, within a few months, the operation's there. And it's, it's not a big operation. But what I had was two membranes, one each side. And... Um, Inside my mouth, they rolled up. You can still feel, I can still feel them when I, when I want to. That was when I began to realise I wasn't an idiot. And the surgeon wanted me to do the letters of the alphabet before and after the operation, but he realised I didn't know the letters of the alphabet. Mm. So afterwards, when I saw him, he encouraged me to write out by hand the biggest book I could find. Your doctor told you to find a book to help rehabilitate your tongue, and you found a Bible. How did you come across that? Well, it was pouring good rain that afternoon, and I ran home to look for a book. I thought there might be a book in my sister's room. I knew there was no book anywhere else, because my sister did read and sometimes read stories to us. 
and um, I was very disappointed to find no books at all. I knew there was scrap paper in the cupboard downstairs uh, where Dad kept his belt, and I thought maybe I could start with scrap paper, but I didn't expect to find a book. Next to my father's army belt, which he did use on us, unfortunately, it was a King James 1611 Bible. It had 1,400 pages in it, um, and I thought, that's a big book. And over the next 18 months, I was determined to learn to read and to write. And um, I found that as I got to write and write, things kept jumping into my head, as the surgeon said he would do, and I began to pronounce the words. But I found I could memorise page after page. So when I wrote it out, I had memorised what I wrote, and I did Genesis and part of Exodus when I realised it's going to take a long time to get to what I now knew was the New Testament. So I started on Matthew, so I had two piles going. And I would think that um, most nights, even with the candlelight, most of it was candlelight, I would work until about 11 o'clock at night. How did what you were reading start to impact your life? It affected me two ways. There was, there was one way which when I read out the first chapter, it took me, I, I must have wasted a dozen sheets. I had been taught to write, and I was writing too big. So I kept writing those first few verses quite a lot, and they've stayed with me ever since. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But this is what it says. The earth was without form. That meant it was ugly. And it was void. That meant it was empty. And if ever there was a boy in England who felt both ugly and empty, leaving school as I was, being an errand boy, the lowest of jobs, it was me. But if God could take the earth and make it beautiful and fill it with content, then what could he do with a life? And I think that began, that idea, if God can do that, why can't he do that with a, a human being? And that has never left me, that concept of every single person can become beautiful and have a content that is a God content. When and how did you accept Jesus into your heart? Well, it took time. The going to church didn't happen straight away. Um, I think I'd, I must have gone through the New Testament at least once. And then I'm, I think I was in my late 15th year or early 16th year when I went to a little chapel not too far away. So they had this person full of questions on the Bible, but they didn't know whether he was a Christian or not. Mm. So one day a lovely man, and he was a nice man, called Mr Barnwell, and he said to me, would you like to be a follower of Jesus? Well, to my natural answer to that was yes. Of course I'd like to be a follower of Jesus. I actually thought in my own way, that's what I was doing, you know. Mm. Um, and we had a talk together and he introduced me to John 3.16 and way of salvation and we said a prayer together. And as far as he was concerned and the church was concerned, I was now a Christian. But I think I became a Christian slowly. I don't think I had that kind of conversion experience. I think, it's, I think it needed time for the Word of God to melt and filter into my heart and soul. And so I think maybe when I was 17, 18, I began to begin to pray um, in salvation terms. And I think it would be another 10 years before I had the confidence to say I was a Christian. I lacked personal confidence for a long time. Robert has made a huge success of his life. We spoke to him about those early years of the disregarded and abused young man making his way in the world. You rose through the retail industry quite quickly. Can you tell me a bit about that? It was, partly because it was a transition period for retailing, mm -hmm. from serving behind counters where I started. But I started as an errand boy and I finished as a, a director. So in 10 years I moved from being the ignorant uh, boy that couldn't hardly speak pushing a bike around to being the director of 1,300 staff. I started with a family grocers around 130 shops. I was able to increase the turnover by fourfold, which was unheard of. So I became a kind of a blue-eyed boy um, as a manager. Then I became a director. 
um, of a region. Then I became a director both of Tesco's, which is a large supermarket in the UK, and also of the cooperative, which is where I ended up. Uh, my, my major job was when the cooperative was a very large operation in the United Kingdom, that we ended up opening the very, very first hypermarket in the UK. You made quite a dramatic leap from the retail industry into the Scripture Union Publishing Company. It was a missionary operation and they were losing a lot of money on their publishing. And the leadership of our church wondered whether I could give them some marketing advice, which I did. And then they said, would I join them? And I only offered them um, six months to turn them around. In actual fact, I stayed nearly six years and we created the first major um, children's Bible that had been created. And we brought together Ladybird Books and Zondervan in the United States and of course Scripture Union and Yorkshire Television, which was the major independent television company in the United Kingdom. So we created 24 books, 24 films, Life of Jesus. We also created New Testament and of course the entire Bible. And the entire Bible was on the best-selling list of one of our major retail operations in the UK called W. H. Smith for 10 years. From there you moved into doing your own publishing company. Can you remember a bit about those early years? One of the things I realised in the publishing world that networking was important and so I was able to persuade various organisations to get involved. CWR was one which was a, a Bible reading ministry similar to Scripture Union and we did over a million full-colour publications for them. When the Billy Graham people came over for one of their missions we was able to persuade them to use a colour Bible gospel rather than their plain gospels and I think it affected the Billy Graham organisation since because they now do a superior better gospel to give away. That was, that was a gospel of Luke we also have been working for students, so we realised that the student market needed to have something they could share with their students who were not Christians, so we produced Bible Gospels for various universities. And one was for Oxford, the famous city, and the person who was leading the mission was a, a man called Nigel Lee, and Nigel Lee eventually ended up running a large part of UCCF, and then the movement as a whole started doing Gospels and today we still work with them and we do the Uncover Gospels, Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of Mark coming up soon, we just done the Gospel of John and they will have done a million by the time we come round to the Gospel of Mark. The past seemed a distant memory, and Robert's life was moving forward, but things were about to come rushing back. After 28 years, your mother walked back into your life. It was 28 years, and at no time did she ever ring or send a card or a greeting, either a birthday or a Christmas card to anybody. My brothers and sisters tried to find her through various means, but they, they couldn't. And then after 28 years, I was coming in from Heathrow Airport. My wife said, your mother's made contact after 28 years. And a few hours later, I went to pick her up to take her to the rest of the family from where she was living. It was about two and a half, three hours journey. And she was nothing like I thought she would be. She, of course, was 28 years older. She was much smaller than I thought. She wasn't small, but she was smaller than I thought. And I found out the person she was living with had died six months earlier, which I think was one of the reasons why um, she came back. But I couldn't find anything out about her life at all. Every question, every thought seemed to say, um, I don't want to tell you. Not, not once did she ever say sorry. Not once did she have a, any regret. And um, she died a, a few years later. And whatever happened with your father? Was there any reconciliation with him? Uh, my father had died by then, some 10 years earlier. He, he died from cancer. And he died, relatively speaking, quite quickly. And he never wanted to say sorry to anybody except his daughter. And he wanted to say sorry to my lovely sister, Jean, but found it very difficult to do so. And I was in the room. He wasn't aware I was in the room. And he was trying to apologise for the past. And he was blind to the other sins that he committed against his, 
his sons, and there were real sins against his sons. And it was a, a kind of a, a peculiar way of dying, a man wanting to say, I am sorry, I, what I did was wrong, but not quite being able to do so. Your wife, Joyce, and you received some very devastating news. Yes, my wife had cancer when she was 18, but we didn't know until she was 24. And it was um, already a bad cancer. And they said if she survived five years, then we could look into the future. And it was about 15 or 16 years later that we realised the cancer had spread throughout the body. And she had a, an unusual form of melanoma cancer, which meant that it attacked the fatty tissues, and that meant she lived a lot longer. But we had um, eight operations. I think we removed something like 30 tumours. And she never complained. Not once did she complain. And um, she got on with the life as best as she could. Uh, no, no how. She already was a, a very strong Christian lady. She had a very personal faith in a living Christ. She changed my life because, and it took me a time to realise this, she actually loved me. And to be loved and to know you, you're loved by somebody is a transforming experience. It's, it's one of those peculiar things. You can have everything in the world. You can be extraordinarily successful. But if you haven't got love in your life, or if you live the life that keeps love away, it's a damaging experience. But I had to grow into it, because I didn't believe it to start with. Shortly after she died, you experienced a personal setback with a huge financial crisis. We had um, a large property company, as well as a publishing company. And in England, in the um, 80s, there was a property collapse that lasted about eight years. And I had, I think, about 32 properties, and every one of them was now below the value that we bought them at. And the banks, not being kind, wanted their money back. So I think we lost about one to a half million pounds. Uh, so when I got remarried, the first thing we had to do was to First of all, mortgage the house, which we did. And yes, it was um, an, another difficult obstacle to overcome. But we overcame it and uh, rebuilt uh, more publishing companies. So now we have a satellite of companies. You've come from very humble beginnings. And now you own a major stake in this park, one of the top tourist destinations in Britain. Yes, it is. And uh, we've won the um, Garden in Bloom quite a few times for the nation, which is very nice. We've got a, a king over there. We've got Mozart over here. So we've got a, both uh, royalty and culture in the park as well. We also, from our offices, we have a tunnel that comes straight in the park going underneath the main road. The Bible had literally saved Robert's life and he wanted others to know the transforming power of God's Word. Robert, tell us about these Millennium Gospels that you promoted through nationwide newspapers. Nobody really wanted to do a Millennium Bible Gospel, and it seemed to me that the most natural thing to celebrate 2,000 years of Christianity was to offer the neat the four Gospels. We produced 10 million Bible Gospels, and we, we produced Matthew, Mark, Luke and John in a very attractive way. And we ended up with 10,000 churches in the UK and I don't know how many hundred thousand Christians suddenly realising they could share the gospel um, with neighbours and friends, etc. We do have to give credit to a, a newspaper in the UK called the Daily Telegraph who got really behind it. They turned it into a nationwide initiative. And then this was followed by an eight-page article um, which we organised with The Express. And that then was uh, encouraged another newspaper called The Daily Mail to do The Life of Jesus by Charles Dickens. So in all, we ended up with some major coverage. It's incredible that one in four houses ended up with a Bible gospel being given to them. And I don't think that there, ever, there has ever been such a nationwide initiative for a Bible gospel, not in my memory. You also made a special edition King James Bible, which you presented as a gift to the Queen of England on her Golden Jubilee. Yes, we have. It was um, a King James Bible. We completely redesigned it to make it much easier to read. 
and um, we were honoured to be able to present a copy to the Queen. I think I was the only individual person allowed to present a copy for Her Majesty the Queen and that also was promoted by the Daily Telegraph. Could you tell us about an initiative you started called Back to Church Sunday? As a result of doing the Gospels, I realised we needed a campaign that said to many people, granddad, grandma, their children and grandchildren, come back to church. That was all, just come back to church. S see it for yourself. Now to the churches, what we were saying, if you have people who have come back, what kind of church do you want them to come back to? I believe there's about 40,000 churches who each year, more than once, will do a welcome back to church Sunday. I wanted something that would grow naturally, that would be totally independent of me, and I don't think I've made a contribution to it. I think for three years I financed it, and then after that it was let loose and it's grown and grown. Robert's publishing companies continue getting the word of God out. We went to his offices to talk to his sons about some of the projects they are working on. All of these things are products that your companies create. Yes, we have a range of companies and different companies do different things. Between the companies, I think about 700 items are made every year. It's grown over the years, it's still growing. Um, the two boys who now run it and there's other people as well. We have about five or six directors in different companies. So it's a lot more than publishing, isn't it? You've been really successful yes, in business. Yes, publishing and a range of other companies as well. Even this place is a separate company. And the idea is that on some of the items, we're able to help out missionary work. For instance, we now have a company looking after glasses for reading. We can produce them for the third world country. And with the help of one or two trusts and our trust, we, we would hope that half a million to a million glasses will go out to help um, third world countries where they desperately need glasses in order to read. So a lot of our um, books, of course, will go to colleges and missionary work and we send two million Bible Gospels out to a company called Book Aid and they were able to get them into Africa. We use our expertise in business to be a benefit and blessing elsewhere. So I see business as a Christian um, vocation. Peter and Andrew, tell us a little bit about the projects you're working on now. We've been working on several projects over the last four to five years. Um, the initial one we did was the Children's Illustrated Bible, which is a 620-page full-colour illustrated Bible. And we've now sold this to several countries, including we have an American version, which went to a publisher called Harvest House, um, who are on, I think, their 11th reprint in just over two and a half years, so over two, 200,000 copies into the US, and we've also done languages like Spanish, Portuguese, Polish, Afrikaans, um, so the books generally go all over the world. This is a derivative of the Children's Bible. Again, I think it was the American publisher wanted to do a read and pray Bible, so it goes through 365 daily readings for the year, then covers that, so it required a slightly different treatment, but the base artwork is the same as this one here. And his wife did the text. And my wife is the author, so she actually wrote these books as well. The latest one we're working on is called Bible Force, which we've actually trademarked the name. So we see this as becoming a brand, it's aimed at the teen market, and we hope to publish this early 2018. <coughs> the slight difference to this project is that the first 30,000 copies, we're actually going to give a free app, so we're building the app at the same time which will come with several features, there'll be audio with it, there'll be an online version. Andrew, how do you see the future of the publishing world? The children's publishing, I think that you know, kids and families and parents, they like to actually pick up books and read. And It's, it's very old-fashioned, but also it's been around for hundreds of years, and I'm sure it'll go on for hundreds of years. And I think it's down to you know, companies like us uh, in terms of the Bible projects, and it's, it's an ongoing project that we're always feeding new collections and new lines in. Your father hasn't had the easiest of walks through life. How has that impacted your lives? He's always positive. He's always got lots of enthusiasm. He's a great encourager. The glass is brimming, full. Andrew, Peter, you can do anything, you can go anywhere. So that kind of like experience of having somebody so supportive can really do a lot for you.
Robert has had an incredible journey. We're here at his home now to find out a little bit more about his life. In going through childhood abuse and bullying and dealing with dyslexia your entire life, what advice would you give to someone going through the same thing? Well, I do meet people from time to time and I have found that the most important thing is to, to love them and to be quiet first. Um, they, need, they need a space to work out their own emotions and their own feelings and eventually they, they come up with, with questions and one of the big questions all these people come up to, and I'll come back to one or two illustrations in a moment, is the, the sense that they are to blame for the things that they have happened. Somehow they made what happened, happened. And that is common, I've discovered, blaming yourself. And I know I blame myself for being who was for many years, so I know where they're coming from. When I was in the institutions, I seemed to be able to gather boys around me who were empty. Their eyes were empty. Their, everything inside them was empty. They had nothing. And they, they wanted to hang around me as if they were hanging around a mother or a father because they were so empty. Now, some of these had lost their parents in the war. Some of them, like myself, had been abandoned by their parents. Some of them had been in an abusive families. And they needed somebody that would be their champion. If they can find somebody in the church, I'm, I'm talking here, godly men, godly women with hearts of love, if they can find somebody who can be their champion, that is by far the best thing. Not to be a philosopher or a theologian, but to be a person who would love them and take them and give them a sense of security. And I found that for me, Mr. and Mrs. Wise and their daughter Valerie, who was younger than me, they became um, psychologically the home, the people that I needed. And I have discovered again and again and again and again that with people who have been abused, and my lovely sister, of course, was raped in her teens by her own father, and she had to come to terms with that. And I've only talked to her about three, three or four times with it because it's so painful uh, to talk about those things. Champions. Who are the champions in our churches and in our chapels and in our fellowships and in our home groups? The people who are going to say, I will adopt this person or this family or these people. Now, both my wives, my first wife and my second wife, have been very good at that. Extraordinary good at adopting people. The Bible has clearly had a huge impact upon your life. What might you tell somebody else who's just coming into contact with the Bible for the first time? I cannot think of anything greater than to be able to talk to people about the love of God in Jesus Christ, given to them by the Holy Spirit, and that love jumps out of the Bible. So it, it, it's as if the Bible is a kind of a 3D book. It will remain um, a flat book to most people. But the moment they open their hearts, things are jumping out of the Bible. There is stuff on the surface of the reading of the Bible that are incredible. We, we mentioned John 3.16, which most people know. God so loved the world, that's on the surface. The next verse goes a bit deeper. People love darkness rather than light. That's a little bit deeper now. And that's the next verse. And, and it begins, you've been so, wait a moment, I actually prefer to love darkness. I want to do things my way. I don't want this love of God. Give me the light nights. Give me the, the music, the dance. Give me a, a selfish way of living and let my life be absorbed with this world and these things. And what John 3.16 is saying, oh no, I can take you and you'll never perish. You'll never ever be in a position that you're in darkness and wasted. You'll never perish. So I love just talking about the Bible, no matter what part of the Bible that um, I'm talking about. What I do know is God loves people, every one of them, no matter who they are, where they are, what they are, how they are, and why they are where they are. He loves them. And he, he, wants, he wants to enter into that relationship. Um, God doesn't dwell in buildings made with hands. He dwells in people. And if we think that by going to church, God is there, God is only there in as much as is in people. And if they are in the supermarket, 
the next day is as much in the supermarket in them as he was in the church before. And if we can grasp that, then we can reach out to people many times. So, yes, I think we talk to people and we develop the habit of sharing the Bible, the good news of Jesus with people. That's life's work and that's worth living.